This is your host, Richard R.J. Eskow. And of course, we are talking, as is everyone, about what else? A pandemic, by the nature of its very prefix, affects virtually everyone in one way or another. And here to talk about it further, I, I always appreciate my next guest's writing, as well as my conversations with him. And he, like many of us, has been writing a series of articles about this. Nathan J. Robinson is the editor and publisher of Current Affairs magazine. He is also the author of several books, including Super Predator, Bill Clinton's Use and Abuse of Black America, Trump, Anatomy of a Monstrosity, and his latest, Why You Should Be a Socialist. Why you, who me? Yes, you should be a socialist. So without any further ado, Nathan J. Robinson, welcome back to the program. Hey, RJ, nice to be here, always. Well, even under such trying conditions, Yes, they are trying conditions, and we are all learning to adapt to them. Let me start with just a quick personal note, if I may. How are you adapting to our changing circumstances, and how are you faring in all of this? Yeah, that's, as, as well as could uh, be expected, uh, uh, given what's happening. I, I'm fine. I'm in, a, I'm in Florida, so I had to leave New Orleans. New Orleans has, where Current Affairs is located, has now one of the highest infection rates in the country um, and I live downtown and things were getting a little scary so I wanted to come back to my Florida hometown to be near my parents but I didn't want to infect them so mm. I have been quarantined for 14 days in uh, some family friends empty vacation house which is where I am right now. So you know this is all affecting us in these various ways. <clears throat> I have these various uh, forms of vulnerability. So, you know, I can't see my own uh, kids or grandkids, mm -hmm. and I have to take all sorts of precautions to open mail. And so we're all just adapting the best we can. But I'm curious, uh, you know, you, uh, one of the things I enjoy so much about our conversations is uh, your willingness to look at the big picture, socially, culturally, history, economically. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that one of the big picture lessons uh, out of this event is that we, as a society, as a culture, as an economy, appear to be functionally incapable of planning for what would not be an inevitable, but was certainly a predictable event. In other words, there's every possibility that something like this would happen, and yet we're acting as if Zeus just appeared and struck us with a thunderbolt. So I'm curious as to your thoughts about that. Yeah, I mean, experts were warning for many years that uh, something like this would happen. I, we had people encouraging us to write articles, but I never wrote articles because they're saying, you know, every every expert is going inevitably at some point there's going to be a huge pandemic, so you need to prepare for it. Um, but uh, we didn't, and now the United States is on track, I think, to have the worst, um, I think we're, with the rates that we're rising uh, make us, uh, we're going to have the worst, um, the worst and most uncontrollable outbreak in the world. Um, and it really is revealing some things about every aspect of American society. Uh, in many ways, I, I do think that the scale of the catastrophe that is unfolding is the fruit of American social and economic policy, right? I mean, we are seeing what happens when you have, first, when you, you, you know, starve the public sector, when you treat government as the enemy and centralized government, and you suggest that, as Ronald Reagan did, you know, the scariest words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Well, now we're going, you know, where is the government here to help, right? And um, when you have uh, private healthcare, right, when you have private hospitals uh, that have no real incentive to do uh, to planning for like a, a, an event where they have to do massive free healthcare for, for everyone, you know, to keep, it's very costly and inefficient to keep a large number of unused ventilators around just in case. Um, and, you know, of course, the economic fallout, uh, the fact that we don't have a uh, a real social safety net in the United States means that when we have this lockdown, unlike other countries where none of them have to discuss the trade-offs 
between you know the, uh, the stopping the disease and um, the harm that comes when everyone gets thrown out of work. Here, because it's such a tragedy when people get thrown out of work because they lose their health insurance and they can't live, uh, we have this giant economic catastrophe that comes from having from dealing with the basics of the pandemic. So we're really seeing a lot of our dysfunction kind of unfold and be exposed. Yeah, I, Nathan J. Robinson, I, I agree with that 100%. But here's the fear I've been expressing all day, and uh, especially in the last couple of days, since the contours of this bailout program uh, began to uh, loom out of the mist, a a which is uh, uh, my fear. Uh, you know, I, I, we all walk that line, you know, optimism of the... Uh, yeah. of the will and pessimism of the intellect uh, uh, to, to throw a little Gramsci in there. But, uh, you know, my my pessimism comes in the sense that we live in a system, economic system, that is endlessly predatory, but has endless resources, uh, including the ability to control the government in times of need and uh, media, uh, except for present company accepted, of course. And... Yeah. You know, so my fear is that, uh, I'll start with the fear and then I'll sh pivot, we, we can pivot to optimism, but my fear is that we are already in the process of taking the glaring lessons that have been emerging from this crisis, the ones that you began to describe so well, and uh, immediately putting them through a giant paper shredder as we speak. But what are your thoughts on that? Oh, I, I completely agree. Um, there's a huge danger that during a crisis like this, uh, people don't have uh, you know some big revelation about that. They go, oh well, clearly having a giant population of uninsured people is bad, so we need um, you know it makes this this makes the case for universal free healthcare. But instead, everyone's just very afraid, right? They're locked in their houses. Um, they're being barraged by uh, confusing and scary information. Um, and the what can happen, and I think what is very possible that will happen, is people in power will seize this opportunity to do what they've always done, right, and to exacerbate existing tendencies. You know, Naomi Klein writes about the shock doctrine and that in right. times of crisis, uh, the right usually very effectively cramps through its its agenda. Um, you already saw that the, for one of the first things the Trump administration proposed to do was strip habeas corpus, right? right. Um, you see that, uh, so, so, you know, you, you can't expect that things will go well or there'll be a massive revolution because it might be that in fact we get more authoritarian governance donald trump of course is on the in, in on the press on the media every day talking about how great a job he's doing and in fact because there's no real serious opposition uh, to him. Uh, his approval rating is going up and up. It should be going down and down because this is a crisis he's directly responsible for. He should be put on trial. He's you know, murderous. Um, but instead, you know, the country is you know rallies around its president in in times of crisis, and that could be very bad. Well, you know, I have to tell you, and this may be a bit of a digression or maybe the natural evolution of this conversation, Nathan J. Robinson, but I have to tell you that as a perennial pessimist about the ability of the political establishment of either party to respond in times of crisis, uh, I have nevertheless uh, managed to uh, override my pessimism with even greater disappointment at the uh, democratic response. Uh, I think it has oh. been ineffectual. I think it has been incoherent. I yeah. think they have failed to pick a spokesman or a leader. Uh, every time Chuck Schumer comes on television, uh, I cringe. Um, you know, maybe uh, Nancy Pelosi would have done a better job from a purely communications point of view, but we don't know because no one person is speaking. Uh, I, I don't want to, you know, digress too far into Joe Biden, but uh, I, I, I am, uh, l let me put it this way, politically, Nathan, I am terrified at this point. Yeah. I, I cannot think of a less coherent response to a crisis. I cannot think of any way a party right. could manage convey in word, deed, and style that they are not the people to trust when your life is in danger. 
Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, Joe Biden, right, theoretically should be the leader right now. He's the front runner for the presidential nomination. Um, and the, the Politico had a report that Joe Biden was hesitating to get involved because he didn't want to seem too political and that he was, quote, deferring to the party's leaders. And it made me think, you're, you're supposed to be... <laughs> the party's leader right you're you're the, you're going to be the president supposedly right you're supposed to be setting the agenda you're the guy and at the time uh when trump was spreading all these lies and misinformation on television and and, and often dangerously so right uh joe biden you know was hide in hiding for a week didn't no one even heard from him um so there's been this this the absence, this real void of of leadership and uh, and opposition, and even when Democrats have come out and pointed out uh, how badly uh, how bad of a job Trump is doing, there's often this you know the, this they they have this instinct which is well we don't want to criticize the president too harshly in a crisis, so they always go well you know obviously we're all on the same you know we're all looking for the same thing we're working together with president trump but you know this thing he said wasn't true um and and that's not the case that needs to be made the case that needs to be made is like we're on the brink of a great depression and he's herbert hoover like this is this is an incompetent uh administration right. I <clears throat> I'm going to stop you there, Nathan. Yeah. Uh, again, Nathan, J. Robinson, because uh, I 99% agree with you, but I think equating Donald Trump to Herbert Hoover very unfair is to Hoover, right? preposterously unfair to Hoover, I would say. <laughs> the, look, I would, and I, I would even go back a step. I mean, yeah. and, 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 and I don't think you were saying this. You were quoting, I know you weren't, you were quoting Democrats and so on as saying, well, we're all on the same side. We are objectively, morally, and historically not on the same side as these yeah. people. We are not on the same side as Donald Trump. We are not on the same side as Gary Cohen or Lloyd Blankfein or some of the other people, Jeff Bezos. They are, at this point, you know me. Uh, you know that I tend to shy away from like the, the, the most extreme of class war rhetoric. They, <laughs> they are the enemy. They have yeah. publicly made it clear that their point of view is that Americans like me and possibly you, because this disease uh, targets some people but also affects other people, are in their deaths are entirely a trivial matter to them as long as they preserve their own wealth. That makes them literally mortal enemies. So anybody yeah. who says <laughs> that Donald Trump and his allies are on the same side is either a fool or a liar or both. Yeah, it's uh, and and it's really been exposed in the last few days because you know Trump started repeating this line that had been uh, circulating in conservative circles: the cure must not be worse than the disease. And uh, you know what what he means by that is you know the economic uh, shutdown, the lockdowns uh, are worse than just letting a lot of people die of coronavirus. <laughs> um, and, uh, and and when you actually break down what they mean by this, um, they're not really talking about the economy being saved. They're not really talking about the number of lives lost being greater in the in the shutdown than the number of people who'd be killed by the disease. Because the number of lives lost, mainstream economists and public health experts say, clearly far more lives uh, would be would be lost uh, if you let the virus just run through society. But what they're talking about, as you say. Uh, protecting corporate profits, right? Because that's the thing that's really going to be hard. Well, uh, of course. And, and that's what they're telling us. And, you know, as uh, as the old quote goes, when someone shows tells you who they are, listen to them, right? So, yeah. um, so I, I guess where that leaves us is, in terms of the, the politics of the moment, is, mm -hmm. look, I, um, I feel... I'm one of those leftists who has a kind of sentimental attachment to old democratic politicians, you know, the kind of yeah. ward healing, uh, you know, what have you. And in that sense, I have a certain sort of brusque affection for a Joe Biden, for example. Um, I get that he's, you know, uh, you know, 
I'll do a deal if you, you know, and you got to watch yourself and, you know, check your watch and wallet and all that. But, you know, he's good old Joe. I, I have a little bit of that in me, but, yeah. and I haven't wanted to bad mouth him uh, as opposed to you, for example, because, be, because, you know, I figure he's going to be the nominee and, you know, we got to get behind him and Bernie's going to get behind him and we got to make sure Trump's gone and he's trying to move a little bit, you know, blah, blah, you know, the whole deal, the whole yeah. deal. So, but I'm just appalled. I mean, I think his yeah. video appearances have been terrible. I yeah. think he does not appear to be uh, um, on his game, shall we say. And, um, you know, maybe uh, uh, we'll take a quick break, but maybe when we come back, you can give me your thoughts on the whole Joe Biden thing. We're talking with Nathan yeah. J. Robinson on the zero hour in lockdown. This is Richard R.J. Escal. Okay, we're back. And um, I'm thinking, I was talking before the break about Joe Biden and the fact that I have a kind of brusque affection for him, but I'm worried. And I think you're more yeah. than worried, right? I, 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 yeah, it, I mean, I I understand why people have liked Joe Biden. I think what we need to acknowledge, though, is that the world right now is not the same as the world a month ago. And to me, a month ago, the argument, there was an argument to be made for Joe Biden. And the argument was, we just need to beat Trump. We need the safe candidate, you know, trying all this radical stuff, you know, it, it's not the time for it. So go with old reliable Joe. He's he's the guy uh, that we can depend upon. Um, and that made a certain kind of sense, especially because, you know, Bernie hadn't driven turnout up in the way that he was saying he would. And Joe was like, well, look, I, you know, I've driven turnout. And, and so it made sense in a certain way. Now, the entire economy has collapsed overnight. We've seen the greatest uh, jump in unemployment, I think, in uh, American history uh, in, a, in a single week. Um, you know, a pandemic is raging that uh, everyone's terrified about their health and getting sick. I, I think that everything has flipped upside down. And Joe Biden, in a crisis, no longer looks like a safe choice. He looks like a disaster because old reliable Joe just disappears, right? Um, in a crisis, you really, really need leadership. You need someone who can take charge, can explain what is going on to you and tell you exactly how they're gonna fix it and give a very reassuring message to the American people. And if Democrats hope to beat Trump, now that's what Trump is trying to do in these press conferences every day. He's right. going, I got the situation in hand. It's all all right. You're safe with me. He will succeed in doing that in November. This is a one issue election now, which is how are you handling the uh, crisis? And if we don't have someone who is capable of basic leadership in this moment, I, I think it's just going to be a calamity. And you know what I think is tragic about this? Well, there are many things, of course, but Nathan J. Robinson is that uh, I could have seen and might have even anticipated now a quality in Joe Biden that might have been right for this moment in the sense that perhaps the Joe Biden of some years ago, uh, mm -hmm. you know, might have presented himself immediately to the public as, you know what? We got this under control. Mm -hmm. You know, it's scary. We're, we're going to go through some tough times. But, you know, he had that kind of uh, old school, uh, hey, it's going to be okay, fight, fella, mm -hmm. you know, kind of thing that could have worked. And I was kind of waiting for it and waiting for it. And they were still building his home studio, which is like, you know, I'm operating from a home studio and it's it's not MGM in the uh you know, in the uh, in yeah. the pick fair days, but it's you can see me and I can see you. Yeah. So uh, we waited for that, and then um, that was not the Joe that manifested himself before the camera. So, so yeah. I'm worried. But let me ask you a question that I have been thinking over a lot in private and talking over with friends and so on, which is, uh, if not Joe, who? I mean, you and I have both been. Uh, uh, yeah, strong Bernie supporters, I believe, but right. you know, there would be blowback to that. And clearly, Bernie's policies and Bernie's vision are right for the moment. 
but right. there's a lot of a lot of people voted against Bernie. You know, I mean, so yeah. um, uh, you have any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, I'm so I'm writing an article on this right now, and the conclusion that I basically have is we 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 need to. I, I think we have to newly embrace Bernie Sanders because a moment like this, a moment like a Great Depression, even if it's unfair to call Trump Herbert Hoover, but a moment like the Great Depression requires a democratic figure like an FDR. That's, that's what it needs. It needs someone who can push the kind of bold solutions that are going to help people about the, out of this horrible economic crisis that they're facing. Now, we happen to have a candidate who has spent the entire primary yelling about how much people need to have their health care guaranteed and how much they need paid sick leave and how much they need to make sure that when they lose their job, it doesn't throw them into total uncertainty. And now has come a moment that should change everything and should make us all wake up and go, hang on a minute, that guy that we counted out, that we thought was too radical, maybe was a couple of months ago, but the world has changed and we need to seriously reevaluate it and we'll see that Bernie Sanders is the guy for the moment. We have the guy. I don't think Bernie supporters should get discouraged. Frankly, from a purely mathematical perspective, there are a ton of primaries left, right? The only reason that people think Biden has sealed up the nomination is not because of the number of delegates he has, it's because public opinion polls had been going so far in his favor. He'd been winning the previous states by large margins. But if public opinion shifts and the elections are delayed, for as it seems like a lot of the remaining primaries will be, um, there's actually no reason why if Bernie started beating Biden by the kind of margins that Biden has been beating Bernie by, um, he couldn't make up the existing gap. It's huge. Um, it's a big gap. I don't mean to uh, say it isn't, um, but it is theoretically possible. There is still time for Democrats to reverse course, which is why I think Bernie supporters need to have a second wave, right? We've got this new moment and we need to push really hard to explain why the guy who seems safe isn't safe. We have the guy you need right now for this. Well, one of the interesting things uh, that I think Bernie himself has been doing, and that may change if he if he and his team uh, begin to adopt your approach, Nathan J. Robinson, is I think Bernie was doing something very interesting and admirable with the assumption that he was no longer going to be uh, the nominee, which is I think he uh, decided to, to create a new kind of campaign in American political history, uh, a campaign that was... Not only when he hired me in 2015, uh, you know, he was not aiming for the presidency. He was aiming to communicate something, but uh, a campaign that not only is intended to communicate something, but to build and model a new ways of organizing that's kind of inside outside strategy for ele electoral politics. And I'm thinking just as one example of the fact that they raised, what, $2 million yeah. for frontline responders to the pandemic in 48 hours. Uh, I'm thinking about the way he's used his campaign as an educational tool, as an organizing tool, and so on. Now, I think what you're saying, and I will reflect on, and I, by the way, I greatly admired that. It's exactly what I wanted him to do. Uh, now, I think what you're saying is he should rethink that and in the ghastly phrase making yeah. of Hillary Clinton's speech makers uh think about being in it to win it once again i mean is I, that yes i think what would that I'm, look like though for bernie yeah. how could how could bernie pivot back to being an actual candidate well, right um so i it yeah, after Michigan and Florida, I thought the Bernie Sanders campaign was over, and I thought, and his his approach has made a lot of sense, which is, you know, uh, turn the campaign into coronavirus relief, you know, help people, help people organize a response to this, because God knows that the existing government is is not going to help. Um, and I think that's actually, for the most part, what he still needs to be doing. I think what he needs to be doing is taking charge in this leadership vacuum, and showing the American people that he is the guy you want in this moment, that he is someone who has a plan, that he is someone who cares about you and is trying to find ways to help you. 
But I think ultimately it needs to, we need to now find it, find a way, and I'm not quite sure how to do it, but to say, you know, and if you think he's, if you think he's the leader we need right now for this moment, we need to make him the nominee because we still have a chance and we need to vote for him. And that needs to be part of it too. Um, because just think about, I mean, I, and I know that Joe Biden's candidacy is striking terror now into the heart of Democratic operatives and donors. There's the report in the New York Times that they're all getting worried about Joe. They're calling right. frantically, going, where's Joe, right? So they're worried. And so I think what we need to do is say to people, you should be worried about Joe. So you really need to rethink it because part of an effective response to this virus is having the leader we need in the moment. Hmm. I'm wondering, and believe me, uh, I um, recoil at the word unity usually used uh, when used in the Democratic Party context. But I was just thinking as you were talking, Nathan J. Robinson of Current Affairs, uh, I was just thinking, well, OK, who could uh, who could Bernie pick as a vice presidential candidate that would assuage the Democratic establishment that candidly, I think, would rather see four more years of Trump than a change in power in the Democratic Party? Who could he pick that would assuage the hardcore, you know, mm -hmm. what Thomas Frank calls the 10 percenters, you know, the professionals yeah. who just loathe Bernie because he reminds them of the limits of their own consciences, yeah. as far as I'm concerned? You know, who would, um, I mean, is it Warren? Is it... Uh, is it Cory Booker? Or is it? I, I, yeah. You know, what I do you think? Know. Yeah, I don't have a good option there. <laughs> right, I, I know. I know. Because right. there are so few people who I think are, are obviously competent. <laughs> Right. Well, I mean, it, and it has to be a, a, a combination of competence and vision and a willingness to carry out the vision articulated by a Bernie Sanders, right? So that's, that really narrows the field a lot. Um, and, uh, but uh, Nathan J. Robinson, if you bear with me, I want to like make a pivot for the final like mm -hmm. segment here, act three, if you will, of this, uh, of, of this interview drama, which is this. Um, let's go from the politics, which is, you know, the mechanics of, of the process to the spirit and soul of the process a little mm -hmm. bit. And I've been thinking about this a lot with everybody I talk to, which is, uh, so, you know, listeners of the show, this may sound a bit repetitious, but I don't, I really, I feel we have seen, as you said, and as others have said, uh, that, that this moment is almost like a, an X-ray, a blast of radiation through mm -hmm. a disease system, showing nothing is flowing anywhere. This is, you know, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a dying system, and mm -hmm. everybody will die except the one who can steal the rings off the corpse, right? So... Um, <laughs> So we have, uh, my metaphors have gotten a little more morbid. Like, you I have like to, that. Yeah, you have to, um, you have to um, I I'll tell you maybe if we get the time on the tweet, I did not post. But um, so, uh, but this is also, of course, a moment of potential breakthrough for social understanding, right? Because uh, this is a moment when everybody can see the economy doesn't work for them, the political system doesn't work for them. Right. Uh, uh, the when they when they're in need, they're expect to, expected to help corporations. Although the corporations will not help them, if if they're lucky and pass through the means testing gauntlet, they'll get uh, twelve hundred dollars, which won't pay most people's rent, much less food and utilities. So, you know, we have this broken system. This is all we also have, uh, you know, Stephanie Kelton's on this week's show, too. We also have a Congress that will spend unlimited amounts of money to rescue corporate America and throw a bone to working people. So uh, if forced to. So, you know, this is a moment where people should be saying, hey, you know what? We yeah. have more power, more tools at our disposal. Right now, the corporate leaders are coming to us with hands out rather than us yeah. coming to them with hands out because they want to save their corporations and their wealth. We have a lot of power we didn't know we have. So what? Let's. Yeah. You know, what, what do we do with that? How do we make sure that happens? 
You know, you know, the funny thing is, uh, uh, we on the left used to fantasize about the the general strike, right? Because right. If you have the general strike, if you have everyone go at, at one at strike on once. That's when you get to appropriate uh, expropriate the capitalists because they ultimately depend on labor. So until if everyone's unified uh, and refuses to go back to work, the capitalists can do nothing. Right, they have to hand over their capital because they, uh, they it only exists to the extent that people are willing to do the work. We have what, what people have pointed out is kind of a de facto general strike right, right now, in which everyone is not at work, and so if you're able to organize, you can sort of set terms here because you can see that there's a massive freakout among the people who own the country, going, "My God, if people aren't doing the work for us, how are we going to?" Uh, how are we going to stay incredibly wealthy? And they're panicking. And so they're calling up everyone in Congress. There's a lobbying frenzy. How do we get our handouts? Um, and so, yeah, as, as you say, I think it is very important for people to understand their, their worth. If the economy tanks without you working, it means that you mattered, right? Uh, it, means that, it means that we all are the source of uh, value. I don't know exactly how you figure out how to how to use that in a way that can get us something. Um, but I, uh, I, I agree with you that this is a moment where maybe things that we never thought possible could be done. So you wrote a book, and, and maybe we'll make this the conclusion. You wrote a book called Why You Should Be a Socialist. I am pronouncing that correctly with the emphasis on the you, right? Yes, yeah, the, the you is big. <laughs> yeah, OK, why you should be a socialist. Uh, what so, so I will give you a chance to both plug your book and uh, make your case, which is, and I enjoyed the book very much, which is um, what in this crisis should people take away that would make them think this is why I should be a socialist? Well, I mean, I talk in the book, about, I sort of define socialism in an unusual way, I kind of start with a socialist standpoint, a socialist philosophy on life, um, where the socialists are the ones who have always looked at the world of hideous inequality and injustice and some people having uh, very little while others have so much and been truly repulsed by it. The socialist is, is the one who refuses to turn away from uh, you know, the hideous miseries that certain people face, that refuses to lie, that refuses to accept uh, the myths about American prosperity because they've seen, uh, they've seen the sort of ugly underbelly. And I think in a, in a time like this, what you see is um, it, it's been kind of interesting seeing the people who self-define as capitalists basically downplaying coronavirus. Basically, they don't want you to look at Italy. They don't want you to look at the hospitals. Uh, they don't want you to look at the real human face of this disease. They don't want you to think about what it means to have so many elderly people. You mentioned you know, this casual rhetoric about, oh, well, it's only older people and immunocompromised people. Well, those people are people, right? And the, and the socialists sees all lives as being of equal worth. You don't measure someone's life by their market value and their productivity. Because if you do, in a time like this, those people will be seen as expendable. And there's a kind of real ugly fascist eugenic philosophy there that says only the strong uh, should survive and everyone else can, can perish. Uh, and it's the socialists who are the ones that recognize just how horrible that is and are, are more committed than anyone else to fighting to make sure that everyone, not just the people we feel like are easiest to save, but everyone is saved and everyone is made whole and, and nobody has to suffer um, any, any more than, than absolutely necessary. And you see that in the fact that like Bernie Sanders is the one, you know, Attack! Uh, he was the one threatening to block the repu the um, bailout bill uh, because Republicans didn't want uh, poor people to get too much in their unemployment checks. And Bernie Sanders is saying, "No, everyone, every single person, deserves the increase, the six hundred dollar increase in their unemployment checks. Everyone." And it, there's, it's not a coincidence that it's Bernie Sanders, the socialist in Congress, being the one to say that, because it's the socialists who are the real sort of authentic egalitarians to their core. Well, I think we, we should leave it there. But as one of those immunocompromised people, 
I think I still have a few good articles left in me. <laughs> the, I think so, too. <laughs> All right. Well, Nathan J. Robinson, editor and publisher of Current Affairs and author of the book, Why You Should Be a Socialist. As always, my friend, keep up the great writing. And as always, great to talk to you. Nice to talk to you, RJ. Stay well.